Praise the Lord, saints. In the name of Jesus, welcome to the Tabernacle Trinity Hall, where I'm your host, James and Pamela. Harold, praise God. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. For this is today that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. And why do we love God, Pam? Because he first loved us. Because he first loved us us. Praise God. Yes, yes, yes. Pam, how have your day been today? It's been a good day. How about you? Amen. It's been a blessed day. They've been a good day in God. God is good. Amen. Amen. All the time, all the time, all the time, Pam. Praise God. He's an awesome God. So guys, how you guys are doing out there? How have your days been? How have your day been today? Amen. So, hey, we are now on part four. Probably the the, the final part of um, the ride for life, the feeling of death. Amen. Take my toothpick out of my mouth. And so the ride for life is to live your life in the abundance of God, to live a good and enriching life. The feeling of death is what we deal with in life, whether we are under the blood or not. What is the difference? And so we've been talking about that. Amen, Pam? Amen. And so we're talking about, you know, going through things. People don't want to go through things. You want to drag your feet when you have to go through something, you know? You want everything to be given to you. And so if God just gave everything to us, then where will your initiative, your will be? What would that be for you? How will you love indifference versus something being given to you and something that you had to go out and sweat to get? So usually when you have to go out and sweat to get something, you, you have a tendency to take better care of it when you get it. Amen? Amen. Because you work for it. And so you put something into it in order to, to get something out of it. That's the difference. Being able to put something into it so that you can get something out of it. Amen. Amen. And so that's why God, the kind of God he is, who he is, he is who he is. You are who you are. I am who I am. And he allows us to have works that follow faith. Amen. Amen. Not faith that follow works, but it sort of like happens simultaneously when you come into the fold of God because in order to believe, you have to have faith. In order to have faith, you have to believe. So believing is works. And, but faith, you have to have. It must first come to pass first. So you're learning to believe in something. So you're working at it, but, but works without faith is dead. Amen, pal? Amen. And so all that prior work means that there's nothing you can do to initiate your own salvation. That's what that means. That means that once all of that work that you did that brought you to faith, when you reach faith, it's when your works began to be not in vain, to be counted for something. And when you're in Christ, God knew us even before the foundation of the world was created. Amen. Amen. So, so your works that are not, that is counted for nothing before faith really is not in vain. Because it's being accredited to your faith after you get your faith. Because you can't have faith unless you believe. And usually people don't believe in something until after they have the information gathered together in order to persuade them one way or another way. Actually, your imagination comes first then your experience, and then the education. 
because the education becomes a part of your experience. We have what you call partakers in the church. Not everybody in the church is saved, but they are partaking in the spirit of God. So they're feeling what the saved people are feeling too because they are in the midst of saved people. And the spirit has been dispensed amongst the church, the, the church, which is the body of Christ, the saved people. And so, but works without faith is dead. Just like faith without works is dead. So you can't have faith in something and not believe it. In other words, believing is a type of obedience. Amen. Believing is a type of obedience. This obedience is, is um, rebelliousness. And to rebel against God is sinful. And so disobedience is equivalent to disbelief. Because how can you believe in something through faith and then be disobedient to it. That's rebellion. That's disobedient. That's 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 to come. That's to come willfully and knowingly against the truth. After you have obtained it, the truth, and you still choose to do otherwise, so you are even held more accountable. That's why I say teachers and ministers and preachers and evangelists in Christ that teach the word of God, we are held double the account because we supposed to know better. And if we do not that which we know better to do, then we will be held double the account. But also it says that when we do do what we supposed to be doing faithfully, that whatever you pay, whatever you pay, that teacher, that pastor, that evangelist, that they are already worth the double. So you could never really pay them for their faithfulness. But you're, you're paying reverence out of your heart. You're giving back into the things that are of God because God uses that as a means to support them. They have to pay their bills too. Amen, pal? Amen. We are not of the world, but we are in the world. Amen. And so God is an awesome God. So yes, so you're working up to believe in something. And then here comes faith. I confess because you believe in something. So you confessed it now in what you believed in being in the blood, in the name of Jesus, under the blood of Jesus. So now you have faith with works. Even though your works built up to your faith and it counted for nothing, but it counted for something when it turned into faith and now it's been accredited for works. Not before faith, but after faith. It's like a delayed program. It's like your work's been on a delayed program. Because you're not saved by your works. Mankind is saved by works because of Noah. But our soul is saved because of the grace of God, because of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen, pal. Amen. And his work at Calvary. Amen. So, yes, faith must come before your works can be accredited. Well, I've been good. I treat people good. I do good. I do this. But if you have not faith, then that is nothing. It goes to nothing. It goes to zero. It cancels out. But when it's towards faith, then it doesn't cancel out. It's like a delayed program. Now it is accounted for something. Because you're proving it to be of God and not to be not of God. Amen. So, so he's an awesome God. So people don't want to go through things, pal. Because they found it to be hard to do. But they want the best things in life. And if you just give it to them, they, they, they won't take care of it. They won't have that compassion for it like they would if they went out there and worked for it and got it. They're, it makes them to have a better story when they become successful. It makes them to have a better story when they become 
whatever your success might be. Amen. Amen. So God is awesome. God, he's awesome. God. So that's what we're talking about. The ride for life, the feeling of death. And so we want to hell that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. But we have to go through some things in order to have life more abundant in Christ. We have to have understanding. We have to have to know how to take care of what God is calling us to, what he's calling us from, what he's giving to us, and what he's acting us to be able to do for one and another, including for yourself and for him. So we don't save our own life because if we did, we'll lose it because we can't save our own life. That's why we have to have faith. That's why we have to have faith so that our lives can be saved. So God, he's an awesome God. So, Amen. yes. The difference between, well, God's creation goes through things, whether you're a believer or not. The difference between those that believe and those that don't, the ones that believe, whatever mess you in can become a message. And whatever test you go through can become your testimony. Amen. So either way, you're edifying and glorifying God. Amen. Through that. Amen. Being in Christ. Amen. Being in Christ. God is an awesome God. He's an awesome God. So we talked about what makes the difference. Are you hearing us saying what makes the difference? So we talk about obedience and what's under obedience. We talked about love. We talked about being subjective to one and another. We talked about exhorting one and another. And then we talked about respecting we talked about reverence under respecting. We talked about disciplining under respecting. You have to humble yourself uh, under the mighty hand of God that he might exhort you at the proper time. So therefore, we talked about timing also under respecting. So we have love under obedience. We have subjective under obedience, exhortation under obedience. And with respecting, we have reverence under respecting. We have uh, disciplining under respecting. And we have timing under respecting. And so the last verse that was on that, I believe we was, um, I think it was First Peter. Um, First Peter chapter 5, verse 10. And it reads, but the grace of, the, but the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After that, ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, stabilize, strengthen, settle you. See, so you have to go through in order to have that know how. It's just like school, guys, first grade all the way up to 12th grade. Then you have college, you know, you have to go through in order to obtain. Your aptitude, amen? Your mentality. Also, that includes uh, peer pressure. That includes your jobs, your experiences, people you know, people you don't know even make a difference in your life. Because if you had known them, you wouldn't, you might be a little bit different than what you are. So everything is and everything not is what make you who you are in your life. In your life. Amen. So the last part of that we want to talk about is trusting. Trusting. Okay. So there must also be trust. We know that obedience has to be there. We know that respecting has to be there. But you also have to have trust. Trust. Trusting. And all of this got to be turned towards God. Christ in you the hope for glory that he worked these things in you coming from him. All things are new when you're a new creature in Christ. So he's working all this stuff of him in you, working you towards his image. He created us in his image. Are we completed in his image? No. The word tell us that, um, that we should be as angels. It tells us that when he come, that we should be like him, not knowing 
not knowing exactly how we're going to be, but the word said that we will be as angels. Amen. Whatever, whatever that means. You know, we don't have a finite mind. We don't have the strength of steel like angels. We can't fly. We can't do. We don't know what we can't do yet. We don't even know what we can do yet. But we know because of the blood that God is now able to work us into his image. And so we shall be like him when he come. That's the new body. That's the new body. We're talking about the new body. We're talking about after being resurrected. We're talking about the day of judgment. We're talking about after the millennium. We're talking about after rapture. We're talking about after all of that stuff. Okay? So, yes, it's a process. Remember we say that Christianity is a process. It's not a job. It's a way of life. It becomes who you are. Amen, pal? Amen. And so it's a process. So, yes, we are created in his image, you know, to be able to acknowledge him and to be able to acknowledge ourselves. There's a verse where I say in Ezekiel where he saw someone in the appearance of a man, but it was, it was, he was like a flaming fire. Head, body, arms, two arms, two hands, two legs, two feet. So when we think about likeness and appearance and say that we should be in the likeness of Jesus Christ. Jesus is in the full likeness of God. For he had the full character of God. He was also in the image of God because he could do what? He could fully transfigure into something that we cannot. So these are things that we have been processed towards. A lot of times we look at where we are, what we is. Yes, some of it is already applicable. But it's a whole lot of that one scripture that have not yet been made known to us. So God is an awesome God. And um, I can, um, the scriptures, I think it's one, hold on for a minute, guys. I was looking at something, I remember writing something down. Uh, 1 John 3 and 2. Pam, turn to Matthew 22, 30. I'm going to turn to 1 John 3 and 2. We're going to read that right fast since, since I touched that. I want to read 1 John 3 and 2 while you find Matthew 22 and 30. And 1 John 3 and 2 reads, Be, be loved, now are we the sons of God. And this is the King James Version. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Yes, so we are going through a process. He made us, he created us in his image. Amen. But we are going through a process of what that is to be still yet. Other than the things that we already mentioned. To be, to be able to acknowledge him. To be able to be self-aware of who you are. A head, a body, two legs, two arms, two feet, two hands. We're not talking about the flesh. We're talking about likeness, but we are working towards the image. We're also working towards the likeness of Jesus Christ, another kind of likeness, character. And we're also working towards another image, the image that we do not know what that image shall be. But we have an ideal. Read on panel if you can, Matthew 22 and 30. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. Amen. Praise God. So we know that, you know, you know, you know, that's, that's, that's a whole, that's a mouthful right there. Because God said, let us make man in our image. And then it goes on to say that he made us in his image. 
And so you can get into a whole lot of different things there. You know, who was involved in that conversation? Was we made like the angels? No, we wasn't made like the angels. You know, uh, was we made like God? Everything that we explained already, being in the image. Yes, those things. So we can get into all that, but we're not going to get into all of that right now. Praise God. So let's go back to trusting. So Pam, if you can read for us 1 Peter 5, chapter 5, verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. That's right. So decision making, casting all your care upon him, your decision making. So you can learn how to live a, a, an abundance life. That's what he want us to do. Amen, pal? Amen. To have life, uh, an abundant life is what he want us to do. Amen. If you can read for us Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and verse 6, please. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not into thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Amen. Amen. So see, we got to trust in him, and we got to acknowledge in him in all things. All things we got to be able to do that, praise God. Because he's an awesome God, and we can do nothing without him. There's nothing that we can do. Nothing, right? So that, okay, we can have life through who? Him, not us. We can have it more abundantly through who? Through him, not us. Now, we're not talking about worldly riches. We're talking about riches that last and last, that does not rust, that the thief can't um, break in and steal. We're talking about the kind of riches that when you lay down at night, you can rest peacefully. Amen, pal? Amen. Because we have a God that does not slumber. He does not sleep. And we can cast all our cares upon him because he cares for us. So we learn to trust in the Lord with all our heart. Lean not towards our under, own understanding. That's, 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 that's the part that we don't want to go through. That's, that's the part that we, we hate going through because there are things that we want to do that we can't do. Things we want to do that we can't do. So the feeling of death is what we deal with in life. You know, a part of it is because of our own temptations. Amen, Pam? Amen. So God is an awesome God. So, so... So we're talking about decision-making. Then we're going to move on to preserving consequences, okay? Uh, for he careth for you. He careth for you. So he preserves us. Pam, if you can read for us Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. My son, <clears throat> excuse me, mm -hmm. forget not my law. But let thine heart keep my commandments for length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shall thy fine favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Amen. Amen. So see, he preserves us. And how do we do that? He, give, he gives us his word. And we meditate on his word. It's how we do that. Our thoughts, you know, our hearts. We meditate on his word. We, 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 he writes his words upon, he takes away the heart of stone. And he gives us a heart of flesh so that he can write on it. See, a stone, you can't write nothing on it. A stone is like just hard, hardness. It's hard to, you got to itch something into something that is hard with something that is harder. And so that goes to show you that there's nothing that is too hard for God to soften. Amen? Amen. There's nothing too hard for God to soften, and there's nothing too soft, so soft that God can't harden. And there's nothing so crooked that God can't make straight. Amen. Because that's the kind of God he is. That's who he is. 
He's a loving God. He's a kind God. Praise God. So we talked about trusting, decision making, and preserving consequences. Now, we talk about the mind a little bit. So what is the other thing? Spiritual mindfulness. Pam, if you can read for us 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Amen. So we're looking at a, a mind thing. You got to be vigilant. You got to be sober. You got to have your mind on the things that are of God. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a resist the devil and he shall, it's a submit first unto God. Submit unto God. Put your mind on God. Resist the devil. Be mindful to resist the devil and he shall flee from you. So we're talking about spiritual mindfulness. We're talking about consciousness. Be sober. Be vigilant. Pam, if you can read for us 1 Corinthians 9, chapter 9, verse 27, please. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So you got to be sober. You got to be vigilant. You got to pay attention. You got to learn how to adapt to the things that are of God so that you can become careful in the things that are of God, that you can prove what is of God, what is not of God through your actions, through your motions, through your thoughts. That when thoughts come in your mind, that's an ugly thoughts. Just repent. Repent and say, that's not of God. That's not of me. I don't own that. I repent. Just, just do that. And it will flee away from you. It will flee. Submit unto God. Resist the devil and he shall flee from you. And then there is a type of firmness. Pam, if you can read 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9, please. Whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren, that are in the world. Amen. So holding on, who resist and fast in the faith. James 4 and 7, we submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You got to stand firm, knowing that the same suffering, you're not going through what you're going through by yourself. We are all going through that together. We are in this world. We're going to go through that death. We're going to go through the things we don't want to go through. We're going to do that. And then encouragement, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. James chapter 1 verses 2, 3, and 4 reads, My brethren, count it all joy. When ye fall into Darius' temptation, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Amen, pal. Amen. And, and, and that's God. Wanting nothing, that's God. That's God allowing us 